Hello, I'm Denise Berkover, the Collections Curator at the Image Center, and I'd like to thank you for joining us for Canada Now, Artists in Conversation. This four-part conversation series is organized in conjunction with the Can Canada Now Photography Acquisition Initiative and the related exhibition on view at the Image Center from September 14 through December 3rd, 2022. The exhibition features the photographic work of 10 emerging or mid-career Canadian artists from across the country, all acquired through the support of funds provided by photographer Edward Bertinsky and Nicholas Mativier Gallery. You can view the other installments of this conversation series right here on the IMC's YouTube channel. And now I am very pleased to be joined today by two of these artists, Zachary Ayat and Alyssa Bistanath. So thank you, Alyssa and Zach, for joining us. I wonder if by way of beginning, if I could ask uh, each of you to just briefly introduce yourselves, as well as the body of work that we have featured in Canada now. So uh, perhaps Zach, you could go first. Sure. Uh, uh, my name is Zach, or Zachary Ayotte. Um, I live in Edmonton, Alberta, um, and I'm a photographer, artist, um, and I work primarily with photographic images and with text. Um, and the work that's included uh, in the exhibition is from a project that I worked on called I Wish You Were Here, which is uh, kind of a way of thinking through memory and thinking through experience um, as it's kind of filtered through memory and, and how much we can trust or how much we maybe shouldn't trust uh, those things as they resurface. Thank you so much, Zach. Uh, Alyssa? Um, hi, yeah, my name is Alyssa Bistanath. I am a photographer and filmmaker out of Toronto. Um, I predominantly work with um, kind of reinventing the archive and uh, adding to it um, issues of representation and uh, community advocacy. Um, the work that I have featured in Canada now is a selection of photographs that I took during the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and it started as an essay just to keep myself sane during the pandemic and ended up being something that um, seemed to connect a lot of dots uh, during that time. So we'll be talking about that. Okay, thank you both so much for those introductions. So the reason that um, we've chosen to pair you both in conversation here today is due to this shared theme that appears in your work um, in that both series are somewhat structured as visual diaries that reflect on your own personal experiences of a particular time and place. So I wonder if you each could speak a little bit more about how that theme is present in your own work, but also how you might experience that resonating in the work of the other. Uh, so perhaps, Alyssa, we could continue with you. Yeah, for sure. Um... Yeah, so I, I work a lot in documentary. And so my first inclination when something large happens, whether in my personal life or in the world is, is to see it through a documentary lens, which is, you know, traditionally a male and what largely white dominated space. Um, and so I think that, you know, as like a woman of color, I'm always trying to look through that lens and see how, um, things like COVID-19 affected communities um, that maybe might not be documented so as intimately otherwise. And so when we talk about um, a particular time, I feel like there, there is this sort of like drastic start date of, of like lockdown in um, Ontario specifically. And the end date is kind of unclear. Like, I don't know if it's ended, but for me, the end date was actually just when one of my hard drives failed and I, I lost a bunch of photographs um, in the piece. And I was like, okay, I'm, I'm good. I'm done. <laughs> I'm done. Um, in terms of place, um, everything that you see in the series, and you know, there's a couple hundred photographs um, in the archive, but uh, the ones that are kind of out and about in the world is about 50 photographs. All of those places and all of those things are within walking distance of, of where I lived during that time. So it's a pretty, you know, um, within two hours of walking from my house. So maybe not more than uh, five kilometers or something like that. So um, I laid those boundaries out for myself during the pandemic because they seem to mimic um, 
what was laid out by the government at that time. So uh, that that was kind of the easy part of the project is 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 making those uh, those direct uh, time and place boundaries. Yeah. So maybe we could ask Zach to talk about about his his work and that theme of the visual diary, and then maybe you could both reflect on on the other's work as well to follow sure. up on that. Yeah, I love that idea of um, of the diary because I think in relation to what you said, Alyssa, about um, documentary traditionally being um, being male and being white, is that it also is tries to operate under the sort of guise of objectivity in some ways. Um, and I love, I mean, I love reading other people's diaries, not in like a creepy way, <laughs> but I just like, I really love that experience of feeling the global um, threaded through the personal. Uh, I just think that the, the way those two play off each other is so important. Um, and it's something that I think I'm drawn to in my own work too. Um, and I remember reading this thing in a piece about Chekhov that he, he couldn't work with the present. He had to work with things as they filtered through memory. Like he had to let things kind of dissolve through memory. And I think by extension through his own experiences and his own self. And I was like, oh, this is, this is it. <laughs> like I relate to this so much. Um, and I feel that so much in how I work and especially um, with photos that I think there is this sense of time that is, uh, that is so sort of essential to how they're made. Um, I work a lot with film. And so I, I think there's the separation between when the image is taken and when I first see it. Um, but then this, this space too, between when I see it and when I come to sort of feel what it means to me or why I maybe under, like understand why I took it or, and maybe that's constantly in flux. But um, so I think that kind of constant filtering through time and through self are so important. Um, and so thinking about this project, uh, that is in the um, that is in the show. It was a lot about this experience that uh, I had with my partner traveling through the states uh, in 2016, in the fall of 2016, um, and having a, a sliver basically in my brain about that I couldn't stop picking at. Of like, there's something that happens, and I can't figure out what it was, and I can't leave it alone. And then about trying to solve why that was. Um, and as time passed, trying to sort of put the pieces together. Um, and I think part of, part of that project is also understanding, am I uncovering something or am I just telling a narrative that suddenly feels convenient as time has passed? Great, yeah. So I, would either of you like to comment on, on the other person's work related to this idea? Yeah, I mean, I think that when I, like I'm, most of my work is memory based or nostalgia based. I, I think I have, I have I have like a direct problem, a re problematic relationship with nostalgia. Like I think that I like it a little bit too much, but <laughs> like nostalgia is actually grief work. So it's it's just this weird thing where, um, you know, when we romanticize the past or we romanticize the present to be then later on romanticized in the future. Um, I think it makes beautiful images, but then I'm always wondering if that language is something that I just know too well, or if it's something that um, can be broken apart. And that's what I really liked about uh, the work was that um, I wish that I had taken those photographs. Like they're they're very beautiful to me and nostalgic, and and um, I, I want to look at them for like prolonged periods of time as as kind of to decode what the what the, the feeling was of the photographer but what the feeling was of like the moment so um uh, i think that in a way they're out of time and place because of the way that you've worked to distort them with lights which is inherently this like thing that's like constantly in motion so um yeah I, that's that's so lovely um and i that idea of nostalgia is so interesting I, like it's funny, I was just having a diff another conversation with somebody about nostalgia in relation to photo-based work. And it, as a result, I was just digging into it a little. And it's interesting because it is initially about place, right? Like I think that, like the roots of nostalgia are about an inability to return to a place, I think during wars. Mm -hmm. um, and now we think about it as so much about time, right? Like I think nostalgia now is almost, well, I think we get nostalgic for time more than place. Maybe that's not true, but um, I think aesthetically it shows up in a temporal way. Um, and there was something so interesting about your work where it was, 
it like there was this vacancy um and so it almost was like this longing or this nostalgia for people right like i was thinking about the empty glove photo um on the street or even the masks hanging from like there are a lot of photos where there is this this sense of absence um that i think draws on that feeling of nostalgia in a new way that isn't about place or time but is about um like connection or about personhood uh, that I found so fascinating. I've, I've read that like nostalgia is like a, like a homesickness or like and yeah. the, the, when I think about like the pandemic, I think about like like I, I remember like when we were like young, my girlfriends and I'd be like, I miss you so much, I feel sick, and it, that's what it felt like during like the pandemic, right? It was like yeah. this homesickness for a place next to a person that you loved, not even like 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 you know like home was like this movable thing. Um, and I don't think a lot of people realize that until they were locked in the places that they called home and how much they didn't really feel good there unless certain people were around them. So I thought that was really interesting. Um, yeah, I think I was thinking about the name of your like isolation. You know, it's like it has this sort of complex layered meaning because I think it's like a noun for in terms of I think how we associate it with the pandemic specifically. Mm -hmm. um, but it does spread beyond that into this just this feeling that I think transcends um transcends the pandemic like I kept looking at your photos and thinking oh you're documenting something that was already here it just became so much more visible um when the pandemic arrived um because so many of those photos I think even though they're so rooted in time do feel like they exist outside of time at the same time yeah, I think that the landscape changed forever, right? Like, yeah. maybe we didn't see masks hanging in windows or gloves on the street before or notice them, but we will, like, forever now. Like, um, yeah, I think that means really something cool. different forever, right? Like, yeah, exactly. Um, I thought that was interesting. I'm sorry, Alyssa. I thought I thought that was interesting, Zach. What you were saying about how uh, the selection of isolation photographs in the show speaks to vacancy um, also because of how that selection fits in within the larger project which started off very portraiture based um, and also portraits of people who are significant to you Alyssa or people in your in your life so there is an absence but also still that distance created by the nature of that stage of the pandemic so hence the, you know, the isolation and separation yeah, I mean, the, the, it was initially called isolation portraits, and then I changed it to photographs because of the, of the way that it evolved. But when Denise and I were like making the selection for Canada Now, we actually like put aside all the portraits I shot during that project. And we we decided to like keep the stuff that I saw on the way to making those portraits. So mm -hmm. in a way, like if you look at the, the piece as like a whole, there's like portraits of people and in between you have these like little like vacancies. Um, but when you just see the vacancies, I think it becomes like a sort of a different piece, but I think that that that's a good thing. Um, and so, yeah, there's like, I think it's like when I look at your work, Zach, there's like sort of like a mysteriousness to those to those moments, right? And I think that, I mean, I'll ask this of you later, but I think, I think that like, <laughs> it's sort of like this, um, like there's a sadness, but there's also like some play there, I think. So um, I think that nostalgia can also be about that. Yeah, I think uh, one of the things I'm really interested in is like um, creating more distrust around images. <laughs> like I think we trust them way too much. Yeah. Um, and I think nostalgia is like, is so tricky with around that because it's so seductive in some ways. And then um, it allows you to tell these stories that maybe um maybe weren't true or maybe have become true you know like it's uh yeah I love that but that's like sort of like what like I'm my family is Caribbean and like that's how stories are told like even true stories are told with an element of like fiction and an emphasis and um deconstruction like it's just the way that things are communicated and so there's an inherent distrust I think of narrative like in yeah totally culture. and so um for me when I say documentary like I feel completely at liberty to um put like magic realism in there or like to um 
to intentionally mislead the viewer. So that's probably why you want to distrust. <laughs> like, <laughs> but I love it. Like that's, yeah. I think that's like, like I, um, this, I'm not saying this is the same, but I love like a, um, an untrustworthy narrator or something in a story, you know, where you're yeah. like, um, or where you get a peek at things and um, are, are sort of navigating what's true and what's not. Because I think, I actually think we do that all the time. And mm -hmm. that our brains are just inherently good at telling stories of of taking narrative of taking like a jumble of things and creating a narrative out of them, um, partially as like a survival technique almost. But yeah, so I, I love that stuff. Um, Alyssa, you mentioned you you had a question, so maybe we can just jump into some of the the questions that you've prepared for each other. Um, but would you like to continue with on that vein, um, Alyssa? Oh yeah, um, let me just see if I can. Um, yeah, so I, I, when I looked at the images, I, I, I thought like you didn't say directly that they were about memory in your artist statement, but like they they struck me as about memory and about the distortion of memory. Um, this idea that like the more we remember the something, the more it's distorted because we're not remembering the incident, we're remembering the memory, and it just it's like this game of telephone. Um, and I see like the interruptions and like sort of the interference that you create in front of what would be considered the, the subject. And on top of that, the subject's face is, is very rarely visible. So um, my question to you is, is, is the new visual language more of a challenge to the viewer to di distrust images or is it more of a challenge to yourself? Like, or is it both? Like, I'm, I'm curious. Um, yeah, it's a good question. And I, <laughs> I'm not 100%. I know the answer. But yeah. I think both like, to me, I, I, I think I often try to be a bit, this is terrible, but they like, try to be a bit withholding. Um, it for, because I want, I want there to be gaps, I think, in the information, um, both so that there's space for somebody to fill it in. And but also so that it does have that feeling of memory where it's patchy, in a ways. And um, yeah, and at the same time, um, I think the way that you said that, you know, stories get told by like revisiting them over and over again, like I, there's something about, I've been thinking a lot about um, the relationship we have to, to like oral histories or just to storytelling as opposed to things we put on paper. Um, I remember reading that like the constitution in the States is considered a living document um, because it can be amended. And I was just like, how is that a living? Like, you know, I think about, about storytelling and about oral histories is so much more forms of like living documents because they're things that kind of inherently have like a form of maintenance embedded in them in the sense that it's something you come back to over and over again and are kind of evolving as time goes by. Um, and I kind of, I wonder now if, if these things we look at in the present, um, even if they don't reflect the moment that we're sort of looking back at, if, if they are in some ways more true whatever that means like as if they're filtered through experience and if they're how we feel in that moment and if that's kind of how we've come to to think about truth and about sort of subjectivity mm -hmm. it's a really vague answer i'm so sorry <laughs> no it's okay i guess i guess like when you i mean yeah like when you decode the images for yourself is it different it's like when you first made them to like now yeah it's so I think in relating back to the thing I said about time, I, I like I often will make a photo and then I need enough time to remove myself from the moment when I took it um, so that I can kind of forget and lose touch with the everything that happened around it. Um, and so ideally they become less and less, like I try and think about photos in some ways as like fiction, which is, is almost silly because it's the, antithesis of what they were sort of originally thought of but um I'm, I'm more interested to that to using them as sort of fictitious pieces and I think as a result yeah they do kind of constantly change as I get farther from them and the more I look at them now the more I feel so removed from them um that they almost feel surfacey at times yeah I mean I think that fits in in line with like sort of if you come from like an oral history tradition versus a written history tradition then there's an expectation that the oral history will be fractured in some way. And yeah. so that's how it translates to photography for me. But like, if your expectation is that it's like written 
like a document that like is akin to like a marriage certificate, then that is a very different thing. So I think that's like, it's actually really interesting to me. Like I never think about the latter. Mm. I th- yeah. It's funny because I've been thinking like there seems to be this tendency in literature lately to write fragmented novels. Um, like it keeps coming up, like just more and more I see them written in this format. And I'm, I keep thinking, oh, this is, this is interesting because in some ways it feels like it's mirroring um, visual art or photography in some ways and that, that each sort of, um, like the, it's, I can't remember the name of the writer, but it's a book called Very Cold People and she just writes little paragraphs and they almost feel like photos, you know, like they and together it's, it feels a bit like going through a photo book one paragraph at a time. And so I'm like, oh, it's interesting that that sort of written work is starting to adopt a structure that starts to break apart some of the elements that of storytelling that can at times be manipulative um, or can at least piece things together in a way that we are accustomed to. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's like the poetic, like in, yeah. in literature that seems to be coming up. I think people are tired, right? Of <laughs> like the, yeah, yeah. Uh, Zach, could we invite a question from you? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I'm so interested in the tension between insider and outsider. I think it's, it's like inherent to photography in some ways because you, uh, you're you often separated by both distance and by like a, a like a physical object, but it felt really um, like a pattern in your work. It, there, there's this sense of both being familiar and removed from all of your subjects. Um, and I was just interested in how that, if you like how you think about that or how it comes uh, into your work, especially thinking about, you're talking about both diary and documentarian um lenses yeah I mean that those photographs are really interesting because a lot of the people that are in my community are writers or photographers or filmmakers or musicians like they're pretty good at constructing narratives so like when I said like hey can you poke your head out the window at this time I think that they had a really clear idea of how they wanted to be photographed mm. because a they've been photographed by me so many times before and they knew kind of what my style is but also like they were in their feelings about the moment and needed a way to like express it so I think that in that way it's like an insider like it's like a closeness or like a curiosity about how the other person is doing but in the images that are in this particular exhibition like the, like your images, I think that people people are largely fractured. Like we never see their faces. Like either their faces are covered by masks, or it's a reflection, or it's a shadow, or you know, like they're just like completely cropped out. And I think that um, that could be perceived as like a distance or like a lack of intimacy. But I th- think that in a way, it was like me trying to like protect a little bit of. The vulnerability of like the moment and how like raw everybody was feeling and and to not put them front and center but to sort of like give these little hints at like what what we were going through so like in, in you know in the land defenders like shot you know like we went to that protest and you know that's my friend it's not like a stranger holding that sign it's a friend holding that sign um but even at that protest, we were kind of like, okay, well, like, are we being safe? Like with the pandemic, like we feel so strongly about that. Is this the right sign? Like, you know, neither of us are indigenous. And so we are like in solidarity, like there's like so many different vulnerabilities in the moment. And so that fracture of like the person or like of, of their body isn't necessarily like a, like a lack of intimacy, but rather like a further closeness. And so then when you see things like the glove on the, on the ground, I don't know whose glove that is like it just right. happened to be illuminated at that moment but it, it felt like a common like experience so like I want to think that I'm always on the inside um but like the way I'm like I grew up in Winnipeg which is like a very different space in Toronto and so I grew up on the outside um of, of culture of you know like the mainstream or even understanding what was going on like in the community um so to see these like spaces that like you know so well, like I walk these like I've lived in in Toronto in this area for 20 years, to see that like the, the landscape transformed is again also an intimate thing. So like I don't know. I, I can't really answer that because I think that like I'm forever an outsider, but trying to be an insider, <laughs> if that makes sense. Yeah. It makes total sense. And I think like 
it's interesting because I think in some ways the feeling that I'm getting at is about, um, as you say, about vulnerability. Like I think there's something about existing between inside and outside is it's almost like being, um, having your guard down or something, you know, or being armorless or something. And I, um, I think existing between those two spaces, there's, there's something about that that come, that really came through to me in the photos. Um, and that I think comes up in your other work too, but it's um, really ex feels kind of exemplified um, through, through those images, yeah. So I think we would have time for one more question if either of you have one that you're, you're burning to pose. I, I really wanna ask you about the fall of 2016 and being <laughs> during that time. So like, um, I purposely stopped going to like America in 2016 because like I, I could see the way things were trending and it felt like a dangerous place for me, um, which is funny because my parents live there. Okay. Um, and so I'm curious, like the fall of 2016, when you say like nothing happened, is such like a loaded moment in history, specifically for that country in, in that part of the country, like, um, yeah, like what were your expectations of the moment? And um, yeah, it's, I is, mean, it, is it about that at all? Or like, is it not at, I, at all? I think it's, in, I'm hoping that it's implicit and not explicit, I guess. Um, but I mean, obviously it's, it's going to be, like, I think it's so hard because so it, it was September. So it was, I mean, what, eight weeks before the election. Um, and we, it's funny because I, so we drove, um, my partner and I got married and this is what we did after we got married. Um, and so we drove down the West Coast. So we went to, down through all of the states on the West Coast and then up the sort of all the neighboring states. So it was eight or 10 or something in total. Um, and we both, after the election thought, yeah, like if you'd gone on our trip, like it was clear what was gonna happen. It just felt so obvious. Um, and we'd, we'd planned it long in advance and as, sort of as the date approached, it was hard not to feel this sort of weird tension looming. Um, but I think I was also really conscious and continue to be really conscious of the fact that um, identifying as queer, but also being white, and a male, um, there is this, I always think of it as like turtling, <laughs> like in the sense that um, I don't wear my identity on the outside. Um, and with my partner, it can be as easy as presenting as friends, you know, like it, um, and I sometimes it doesn't read that way. And so I think in some ways the nothing happened thing is about um, trying to both acknowledge that nothing happened to us, um, that the feelings that I had didn't um, manifest in an outcome that was harmful to us. But that was in part a product of who we are um, and how we look. Uh, and I think, yeah, <laughs> I don't know if that answers the question. But No, I'm just, I'm just like so intrigued by that, like, that statement, because like, it's the personal and it's it's the the communal as well like mm -hmm. um if, like, i think that something could ha have happened you know what yeah. i mean like it's just it was so um like the preceding two years have been such like a dangerous time like in in that part of the country um it's funny i remember i i watched the or I listened to like election coverage after, like, and sort of, I mean, people were, are still thinking about that election, right? But um, I remember seeing that Nevada was considered a purple state and we're being like, oh, <laughs> like I did not feel that way when I was there. But then I was like, maybe this is like, part of me is also trying to implicate myself in terms of my perceptions of, you know, like I come from a conservative province and I, I know that Alberta gets sort of blanket painted as that um and then living here is a different experience for some people and i mean edmonton especially is like is relatively liberal comparatively liberal i suppose um and so i i came back and thought oh did i did i misread the situation or or did i not you know um 
And I think the other half of it is like, I think traditional narrative storytelling, especially about, um, I think anybody marginalized, but I'll just say about queer storytelling generally is that it's something bad happens. <laughs> it's like that something goes wrong and that something that makes a story worth telling is um, some degree of tragedy or violence or whatever. And so I think in some ways, the fact that the story was about something was not happening, but the feeling that it might have um, and that kind of, that being reflected back through kind of historical situations where it did um, was part of me thinking about like, oh, how is my memory um, of past events distorting this one? Um, and is it, uh, you know, like how much can I trust this as it's filtered through my own experiences? So I think this might be a really great place to kind of conclude and, and bring us back to the theme of Canada now, having just sort of talked about our neighbors in the States, um, maybe bringing it back to Canada. So I'd like to ask each of you if you could maybe speak a little bit to what it means to you to be included in this Canada Now project and what that name means to you, which I know is a loaded question, but I'd love to hear your thoughts. Uh, so either of you are welcome to go first. Alyssa? Yeah, I mean, like the word Canada is loaded, right? <laughs> like, I feel like, <laughs> like in this moment where like nationalism is it's such a tricky thing. Um, I mean, obviously, I, I'm so honored. But I mean, this has been it's it's been um, a couple of years now since you know we've been talking about the inclusion of the work in this, and it, and it means a lot as like a, a photographer, like to to come like alongside these other photographers who like some like I've met before, but like like others like Zach, I I, I didn't know. Um, but yeah, it, it seemed like an interesting way to mark a moment because in 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 um, the acquisition, I think that there aren't any other very clearly about COVID-19 projects in there. And so, um, but the whole impetus for like the 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 collection is is because of the pandemic. So um I don't know, it was just like a really warm like moment to to be included in this and to even to go to the opening the other day. It was really um yeah, to present your work alongside your peers is always something that is is I think is most photographers' dreams. So um thank you, Alyssa. And Zach? Yeah, it's, I, it, I totally echo that. It's hard not to feel just like totally honored by um, being in this position. It's, you know, it's remarkable, um, and like a dream come true. Um, and as you said, I think thinking about it through the lens of Canada is, is complicated right now. Um, I was, it's so interesting, Alyssa, when you talked about the archive, because I was, I was revisiting the first, that maybe it's the prologue to the Carmen Maria Machado book about uh, the, in the dream house. And she talks about the violence of the archive. Um, and like, I would, I think about that in relation to, in relation to the word Canada. And like, I think um, looking at the work that was selected, I think about um, how, about sort of broadening that archive and just sort of like filling in so many of the gaps that, it's yeah. subversive actually in a way to say like yeah this, yeah this is this is Canada now yeah like yeah no yeah, yeah totally um but yeah no um a lot of warm thanks to the, the image center and to uh Nicholas Mativier and um Ed Bertinsky who I um had a chance to meet at the opening so that was cool wild oh, I'm jealous <laughs> We're sorry you couldn't join us, Zach. Uh, Me too. That's the nature of having people in the show from <laughs> all over the country, which which was one of the main goals of of the selection was to be inclusive in in many facets, and that also includes geography. Uh, but I want to just say thank you both so much for your perspectives and for sharing openly with us, both in this conversation, but also through the work, which we're just thrilled to have. So thank you, Alyssa, and thank you, Zach, and thank you, everybody, for watching. <laughs>